Well, we're going to continue on with our series this week and finish up with um, a test of faith. We've been talking about Abraham's journey of faith for the last few weeks. And today we're going to talk about the test of faith. So I'm going to begin with a story about a college student who uh, <clears throat> was applying to get into graduate school. And he was told he'd have to take the GRE, which is the graduate record exam. And uh, it's a general test for entrance into graduate school. Well, the school that he was attending never required this test before, so they were just using it right now more or less as an experiment to see the score on the test had any relevance to uh, the students who would actually be in the class, so that it wouldn't count against the student no matter what he did on the test. So since the test had no bearing on the student getting into the program, he said, well, why should I prepare myself for this test and get all upset about it? So he did something pretty risky. He went to the computer lab where they had to take the test on a computer, and it was a multiple choice test, and he selected the letter C for every answer. So it took usually four hours to complete. He completed it in an hour, and the lady at the testing center said, wow, I wonder how he did that so quickly. But he just answered C for everything. He didn't even think about the question, really didn't even read the question through. But the biggest surprise is when he got his score, he received an average to above average mark on the test. So he didn't think through any of the questions. He just answered them with the same answer. So obviously there was something wrong with that testing system, to say the least. And it'd be nice if all our tests in life were the same way, right? We just give them the same answer and we come out ahead no matter what happens. But as you and I know that Life doesn't work out that way, and many of the tests that we go through in life are difficult, they're demanding, and they take an emotional or a spiritual toll on us at times. And we've been studying Abraham and learning what it means to be a person of true faith, but God tested Abraham's faith really in the most extreme way, and we're going to learn about that today. And he asked Abram to sacrifice his own son as a test of faith. Now let's throw in a little disclaimer before we read the story. Now every test that God is giving you is from God. Sometimes it's just life in general, some little things that test us in life. But God does test us. He doesn't tempt us. That's the job of Satan. He, he tempts us. But God does test us. But in Abraham's case, there could be no doubt that God was giving him, indeed, a test of faith. And... Uh, Maybe he'll send one our way sometime that we don't expect it. So let's learn today about Abram and start off in Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. It's, it's quite long. I'll try to go through it as quickly as I can. But God called out to Abram. He said, Abraham. And Abram said, yeah, here I am. He said, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah and go there and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. So the next morning, Abram got up. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him. And he took his son. He chopped some wood for a fire and a burnt offering and set out for the place that God had told him about. Now on the third day of their journey, Abram looked up and saw the place in the distance. Verse 5. He told the... Uh, people that were with him, stay here with the donkey, and the boy and I will travel up a little further on foot. And we're going to worship there, but we'll be right back. So Abram placed the wood and the burnt offering on his son's shoulders, and he himself carried the fire, because they had to bring the fire with him, and also a knife. Now, verse 7 says, Isaac, the son, turned to his father and said, Dad, we have fire and wood but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Well, in verse 8, verse eight he, Abram said, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they both walked on together. Now, verse 9 says, When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abram built an altar there, and he arranged the wood on it, and then he tied his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. It must have been a hard thing to do. And Abram picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice before he was a burnt offering. 
And just as that happened, verse 11 says, an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abram. And Abram said, yes. Abram, the, the angel replied, don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. So Abram was here ready to sacrifice his only son in obedience to God's word. And God seen how obedient he was and said, you have withheld nothing from me, even your son. Verse 13 says, Abram looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket just shortly away from where they were. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that place Yahweh Yerah, which means the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And to this day, it says, people still use that name as the proverb, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Now, mountain in biblical terms actually means kingdom. So in the Lord's kingdom, things will be provided. And that's what this is all about. He had the faith that God wanted him to have, and God tested him to see if he would sacrifice his son who he loved so much. And Abram was willing to do that. But God stopped him ahead of time. He just was testing his faith. What would have happened if Abraham didn't have that faith? I don't know. So there's three questions we need to ask ourselves when, when the testing of our faith comes. Number one is, can we choose between two loves, like Abram? That's the choice that... God asked Abraham to make, and technically speaking, there was no choice, really just a command for Abraham to sacrifice his son. So that's what God told him to do. But in obeying God, Abraham was forced to choose then to kill his own child. So make no mistake, God knew that he, what he was asking for. He knew what he was asking Abraham to do. And he goes out of his way to mention that he knows how much Abraham loves Isaac, because that's what it says in the Word. In addition to that, Isaac's success would mean the end of everything that God had promised Abraham up to this point. Now, why is that? Because the promise God made that a whole kingdom would come through Abraham's bloodline. And if he killed his son, then that would be the end of that, wouldn't it? So here's the dilemma Abraham faced. He had to choose between the God that he loved and the son that he loved. That's a heck of a choice. So many years passed by, and Abram and Sarah had no son. Remember how long it took him to get this son, right? And now he had to choose between God and this long-awaited son. Sarah was 90 years old, and Abram was 100 when they had this boy. So when God commanded Abram to sacrifice him, I think Isaac was probably in his 30s, according to what it says in the Bible. He wasn't just a small little child. He was a grown person. There can be no doubt that Abram loved his son very dearly. But now he was forced to make a choice between the son he loves and the God that he committed his life to. I mean, it's unimaginable having to face that choice. Now, what would I do? What would you do? Abram took his son up to the mountain and prepared to sacrifice to him. And for most of us, hopefully we'll never experience that test by God. And I'm certain that God, not only giving Abraham a personal test of faith, but he used it really as an example for us that came afterwards to know what complete faith and obedience really mean. So it's not something we just take on Sunday and say, oh yeah, I'm faithful today. Monday's a different story, right? God wanted to impress upon us with his word what it really means to have faith in him. Not just in the good times, but in the bad times too. It's a personal test of our faith. So the lesson from God is clear. We're put to put him first in each and every situation that we find ourselves in, even when it doesn't make any sense. Now, to be perfectly honest, I've, I've thought about this. I don't know if I could have done what Abraham would have done. That's, that's, a, that's truly a test of faith. It isn't that I don't believe or that I don't want God first in my life, but... Maybe our faith isn't strong enough as humans, right, to do that. But it reminds me of the father of a demon-possessed boy that Jesus healed, and it's found in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, and it says, The father cried out, I do believe, Lord, but help me overcome my unbelief. 
So what does that mean? We believe, but we don't always believe enough to do the hard thing, to make the tough choice, to allow God to work in our lives. You know, He does things even in the smallest little ways. Yesterday I came home from the grocery store and I loaded the car and I brought the stuff from the car right to the kitchen. I didn't go in any other rooms. I couldn't find my car keys. I could not find my car keys. I searched for them for almost an hour. I looked in the car, I tore the car apart, looked under the car, looked in the hallway, looked in the bags that I threw away from the groceries, because I usually hang the keys on the side of my pocket when I come out of the car. And I, I just couldn't find them. So what I should have done in the first place, I finally didn't. I said, Lord, help me. I need help. And I walked back in the house, and here are the car keys hanging on the back of my wife's sweater that was hanging on a chair that's in the hallway where her desk is, and I guess the keys caught on her sweater when I was walking, and there the keys were. And I passed that chair three or four times. I even pulled the chair out from the desk to see if the keys fell down on the seat of the chair, but did not see those keys. So God works in all kinds of ways, and sometimes we need to rely on Him even for the smallest thing. Yeah. Even for the smallest thing. Anyway, Somehow, with God help, we need to say that, God, we don't understand the test that you sent us through, but no matter what it is, we're going to do what you tell us to, just like Abraham. Now, our second test of faith is, can I obey even when it's difficult? That's sometimes hard to do, isn't it? Can we obey? Does anybody know anything about horses? Well, Arabian horses apparently go through some rigorous training in the deserts of the Middle East. And the, the trainer requires absolute obedience from these horses. And, the, and he tests them to see if they are completely trained. And it says the final test is almost beyond the endurance of any living thing. The trainer forces the horses to do without water for a lot of, several days. Horses need water. And he said, then he turns them loose. And of course they start running towards where the water is. But just as they get to the edge, ready to plunge into the stream to get a drink of water, he blows his whistle and the horses stop because they're trained so completely. They stand there quivering, looking at that water that, which they miss and they need. And they turn around and come running back to where the trainer is. They stand there quivering in perfect obedience. And when the trainer is sure that he has their obedience completely, he gives them the signal and they go tear into the thing and drink the water. Mm -hmm. Now that's some strict training. That's some strict training. It might be severe when you're on a, in the desert, right? Without water. You need water. And your life is entrusted to a horse. The horse better be obedient, right? That's why they train these horses to be so obedient. You can't have those horses just do what they want to do and leave you flat in the desert. Because if they, you got off the horse or something and they ran away, you'd be in big trouble. So when we read the story of Abram and God's command that he sacrificed his only son, it sounds unbelievable. It sounds cruel, doesn't it? It sounds cruel to us as humans. But watch this. I believe we need to remember that Abraham was named father of a nation. That's what Abraham was named. And the father of all who had come to Christ down through the ages. And he had been chosen by God to, to a <clears throat> special place in the history of God's people. So God needed to make sure that he was a, truly a man of complete obedience, of complete faith, and would leave no doubt in, in Abraham's mind or God's that he could fulfill this huge monumental tax that God has given him. And for most of us, prayerfully, this test won't be as severe as Abram's, our test of faith. But God will send tests of faith into our lives. Yes, He will. And if the test had no level of difficulty, there wouldn't be any test at all, would it? There wouldn't be any test at all. What about when Jesus fed 5,000 people? What happened before that? In, in John uh, chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Jesus saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him and turning to Philip, he said, where, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? And he was really testing Philip when he said that, for he already knew what he was going to do. And Jesus knew he was going to make that bread appear and feed him. 
In James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. Now that's a strange saying, isn't it? When a trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. It says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. And that's why God tests us to make us to be able to endure these things so that we won't feel completely dilapidated when a test comes our way, when hard times in life come our way. We're not going to collapse under the pressure because we know from other tests that God has built us up that we don't have to worry that God is with us. So James let us know this testing is a normal part of our lives as Christians. Just because we're a Christian doesn't mean everything is going to be rosy. No. And a result of our endurance, as that grows, then what happens? Our faith grows, right? And our relationship with God keeps on growing and growing and growing. Now, I don't know what kind of test we're going to go through or as a people or as individuals. It might or might not be from God, but whether it's from God or not, God can use the test, whether he brought it there or not, to test our faith. Maybe you've been some time without... I don't know, let's say for the people who are listening, they don't have a job which a lot of people don't nowadays, right? They don't have a job. Perhaps their kids have gotten into trouble. Perhaps somebody's testing our patience. That happens a lot, doesn't it? Sometimes from our best friends, right? They, they, what's the old saying? You're getting on my last nerve. Right? Or maybe you can go through the test of prosperity where God sees whether we'll really put him first, right? Maybe we'll win the lottery and then forget all about God. Then... Momentum, money, monetary things become the first thing in our life instead of God. So, but the bottom line is, do we obey and do what God says to do even when this life isn't what we'd like it to be? Well, if we're like Abram, right, we'll say yes. And we'll obey no matter what happens in our life. Yeah. We'll obey no matter what. And if we're not like Abram, I think we need to pray that we will be like him. Pray for God to help us change so that we can be obedient. And the third test of faith is trust God to do what is right. <clears throat> now you can't have faith in somebody and then not trust them to do the right thing. Otherwise, why bother? Yeah. If you're not going to listen to that person, then why bother? Yeah. But if you're going to put your faith in them, then you... You've got to know that what they're telling you is to do something right. It's like a child and, and your uh, parent and the child, right? You know what's right. Sometimes the children say, why is he telling me to do this? They don't know what they're doing, but the parent always knows best, don't they? Well, God is our parent, isn't he? And he knows what's best for us, even though we may not see it at the time like a child doesn't see why they're being told to do something. So let's get back to Abram's story. Abram takes Isaac on the mountain. He has his son carry the wood that he's going to be tied to, right? And as they're climbing up the mountain, Isaac asks his, his father, why do we have this wood? What's going on here? There's no sacrifice, but we got the wood. And Abram said, God is going to provide a lamb, my son. So Abram built that altar, put the wood in place, and put his 30-year-old son on that altar. Mm. Lifted up his knife, ready to plunge it into his son's body. But then that angel of the Lord came. I wonder how that son ever had faith in that father again after that. We should have had faith, right? His father listened to God, and, you know, and the, if the son knew anything about faith, he knew that God wouldn't, didn't want to hurt him. Because he, the angel said, lay down the knife, don't hurt the boy in any way, because I know that you truly fear God, you have not withheld anything. So the son should know that his father's faith is the most faith anybody ever had. And I can't imagine what Abraham must have felt at that moment to say nothing of the son like you said. But I'm sure we all have a lot of questions about this passage and we really can't answer like that question there. We only can, can surmise, right? But the biggest one that's answered is really in the New Testament, found in Hebrews chapter 11. 
And it says, it was by faith that Abram offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. And Abram, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Now verse 19 says, Abram reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. Because he knew that that was the son that had to fulfill what God had planned. So, a so Abram said, well, we know God can do all things, so if I sacrifice him, I'm sure God can bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abram did receive his son back from really the dead, didn't it? Because he was never killed in the first place. So what Abram was thinking actually really took place. His son was saved. So that tells us a lot about Abram's faith and why he was able to pass God's test. Because he knew, because of God's promise, that his son would somehow have to play into this thing that God had promised earlier. So he had faith to go, okay, I'm going to follow whatever instructions I'm given. So on one hand, he knew what God had told him. On the other hand, he knew that God was asking him to kill off the bloodline through which the promises would be fulfilled. So if we put those two things together, he came to the solution, and he assumed that if he took his son's life as God commanded, and God was also planning to bring that son back again to fulfill God's promise. And if you have faith in God's promise, then you would know that that promise will come true some way or another. So that is tremendous faith in God that Abram had, and it's really a great example for each and every one of us to, to strive towards that type of faith in our lives. So let me just do a few words before we close that I think should help us out. And I know most of us probably do not have a faith as strong as Abram demonstrated. But I know there was a time when Abram wouldn't have passed the test either. He didn't have that faith in the beginning. Abraham had many tests of faith throughout his lifetime. And, and some of those tests he failed. He failed the test. And it was only after many years of walking with God that he learned that he could place his complete trust, right, in God, and obey him no matter what God asked him to do. And we need to do is put our life in God's hands and trust him so that we know that he will always come through on his promise. How do we do that? How do we know more about God? By reading his word and by praying. Those are the two means of communication on how we grow our relationship with God. How do we trust Him better? By reading His Word, by praying to Him. Can we choose between two loves? Can we obey even when, it, when it's difficult? Can we trust God to do what is right? Those are the three things we have to keep in mind. And we can do that if we just trust Him to always come through on His promises. If we believe in Him, then we need to trust in Him. Right? If we believe the Word, you believe God, because God is God's word, isn't it? Pay attention to God's call in our life. Have that commitment when he does call us. These are all things we learned in the last few weeks. Have the eyes of faith. See things through God's eyes, not ours. And be ready for, finally, the test of faith when it comes our way. So Abraham had a, quite a journey of faith in his life, and he trusted God completely. And the same thing is for us today as we pray. No. The road of our journey of faith is open right now. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that you are a loving God. We thank you that we can trust you, Lord. Maybe some of us have, have started our journey and got off track. Maybe we've been choosing between two loves. Maybe we think it's too difficult to get on this journey. Maybe some of us didn't have faith to trust you completely. Well, we ask that you would help each and every one of us that has any one of those problems today, Lord. Whether we're here in this place or whether we're listening to this broadcast. That you will come into our lives. Help us to get started on our own journey of faith. Help us to choose when we have two things that we're choosing in life. Two loves. Help us to know that this journey is not a difficult one because you're with us every step of the way. Help us to have that faith to trust you completely 
so that we can have a successful journey that you have already given us in advance. We thank you, Lord, for, for the journey. We thank you for giving us a purpose in life. And we know that you've equipped us to take this journey. You've equipped us with all the luggage we need to go on the journey. With all the items we need to keep us on the right track. Help us to focus on the righteous road so that we don't take the wrong turn. Keep us on the designated route, Lord, so that we can reach where you have wanted us to go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.